Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott and I'm here today to give you my video review of the Canon RF 100-400mm. This is an f5.6 to f8 IS USM. So IS means that it has a built-in image stabilizer. USM refers to the nano USM focus motor that is a part of the design. Now this is an interesting counterpart to the uh, RF 100 to 500 L series lens that I reviewed several weeks ago uh, for a lot of reasons. The most obvious of those reasons, however, is that the L series lens retails at about 2,900 US dollars, while this lens retails at a much less expensive 650 US dollars, meaning that you can literally buy four, four of these lenses and still pocket about $300. So for many photographers, no matter how good the RF lens is, and by the way, check out my review, it is a very good lens. But no matter how good it is, for many people, that is simply a price point that they just can't afford. And on the Canon RF mount, while there are some wonderful cameras and uh, Canon has a lot of strengths going for it, what there hasn't been is a lot of options uh, in the more affordable range. So I'm really happy to see a lens like this, and it's not quite as quirky as, say, the you know the 600 millimeter f11 and 800 millimeter f11 prime lenses. It's a little bit more conventional, but what it does give you is a really compact package for this kind of focal length, smaller than really anything that I've ever seen before covering this focal length. But also at that price point, it is something that a lot of photographers can afford. That's not to say that it's not without some compromises to get to this size and price, and we'll explore those as a part of today's review. First, however, a word from our sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by Phantom Wallet, the minimalist modern wallet that sets you free from the bulky traditional wallet while also making it easy to access your cards and money when you need them, thanks to their unique fanning mechanism. Visit phantomwallet.com to check out their unique sizes, styles, and finishes that span from aluminum to wood to carbon fiber. You can even customize your wallet with new accessories like a money clip, cash holder, ID display, and even the Chipolo tracking integration if you're the kind of person who loses their wallet. Use code DUSTIN15 for 15% off when you're ready to check out. So let's talk about that package here for a moment because this is a truly compact lens and I set it just for the fun of it. I set it up next to my Sony 200 to 600 millimeter uh, G series lens and as you can see, it is a fairly ridiculous difference in size. This is a lens that is really very compact. It is less than 80 millimeters in diameter, giving you a very conventional 67 millimeter front filter thread, right under 165 millimeters in length, and it weighs in at only 635 grams. And so that means that it is significantly sh a narrower, shorter, and lighter than what the L series lens is. That L series lens weighs in at 1,365 grams. In fact, I found it interesting. This lens at 635 grams undercuts even the 70 to 300 EF lens, IS Mark II lens, which was right over 700 grams, about 710 grams. And so this is a truly compact package. And that I think is going to be one of its real strengths because it's not just price that limits people, but uh, there are a lot of people that are just not physically capable of carrying a large heavy lens for any kind of extended period. So this enables them to, uh, in, in, to get into this focal length, which is an extremely useful focal length going from this wide at 100 millimeters all the way into this narrow at 400 millimeters. Obviously, there's a lot of applications for that kind of zoom range, but this is a package where people can actually bring it along and maybe even carry it for a significant period of time without being too concerned about the weight. Now, downsides to this package, some of them are the conventional ones that apply to any non-L series lens. Namely, you're never going to see weather sealing in a lens like this, and they don't even include something like a lens hood. And so that means you're going to have to spend an extra about $45 on a lens hood, though I'll also throw linkage to a very inexpensive $15 one from Velo at B&H Photo. 15 bucks gets you a lens hood. And, and I just kind of hate to reward Canon for that nickel and diming kind of thing. 
thing. But so, I mean, those are some typical limitations that you're, you're not going to get those type of features. But what you've also get, got here is a fairly severely compromised uh, range in terms of a maximum aperture. So it starts at the slow end of what uh, we used to see on, say, the, the EF 100 to 400 L series lens. It, you know, topped out at f5.6. This lens starts at f5.6 by 135 millimeters that it's at f6.3. Before you get to 200 millimeters, it's at f7.1. And shortly thereafter, you arrive at f8. So uh, you're going to end up with a zoom range. Throughout that zoom range, you're going to end up with a really slow maximum aperture. And that has a variety of consequences. The consequences, the most obvious ones, are you're going to need a lot of light to get, uh, to keep your ISO down at a reasonable level with this lens. And so this is really a more of a middle of the day kind of lens, not really a dusk or day, daylight type of lens. Or in those situations, you're going to have to really jack up the ISO, which obviously comes with some other uh, serious, uh, serious hits to your image quality. The other aspect of this, however, is that many lenses, including this one, by the way, they achieve better performance optically when you stop them down. In this case, however, because the maximum aperture is so small, you only have a very small amount of headroom for stopping the lens down before you start to run into an effect called diffraction. Diffraction comes when you have a very small hole and as light comes in, it kind of bends. And as it comes out the other side, it confuses and, and blends together. And so you get some reduced contrast and not as fine of detail. Well, obviously in a lens like this, I mean, typically stopping a lens down a fair bit would arrive at f8. Well, here you're starting at f8. So even stopping down only one stop, you're at f11. Two stops, you're at f16. And f16, you're almost always going to strongly see the effects of diffraction, particularly on a higher resolution body like my R5. So this is a lens that if you're shooting something like the R6, you may get away with a little bit more in terms of stopping it down, but certainly not the higher resolution bodies. That's another side effect from that. Now, here's an interesting thing where that is, uh, it's a disadvantage because of that aperture, but it's an odd strength for the lens in general. And that is that unlike the RF 100 to 500 L series lens, this lens is fully compatible with Canon's extenders. That really surprised me because I didn't think such a compact lens would even have room for them, but it does. In fact, you're compatible all throughout your range, though obviously you're going to have some serious limitations once again. If you put on the 1.4 times extender, yes, you're going to be able to reach up to 560 millimeters, but your uh, maximum aperture is only going to be f11. If you put on the two times extender, yeah, you can reach up to 800 millimeters. Your maximum aperture, though, is going to be f16. So that's going to limit autofocus. It's also going to limit being able to get sufficient exposure in a lot of situations. And I wouldn't recommend going to the two times extender for a whole lot of reasons, not the least of which this lens isn't sharp enough to handle the hit from a two times extender. A 1.4 times maybe, but the very fact that it's compatible, compatible with those is certainly a mark in its favor. Now, as far as other features on the lens, it's pretty bare bones. You've got an AF MF switch. You've got an on and off for the stabilizer. Canon does say that it will detect when you are panning and, uh, and it will adjust accordingly. And that seems to be the case. I think, you know, for example, this is from a shot of loons that we'll see a little bit later. And you can see that it's done the correct panning effect for that. There is a zoom here, and the zoom action is actually nice. I actually kind of prefer the zoom in a little bit compared to the L-series lens, mostly because the throw is enough to do in just one motion. I found the other just a little bit too long in terms of its rotation. You've got your manual focus ring, and then up front you've got the control room control ring that you can put to a number of different purposes. And on the side of the lens, you have got a lock mechanism that you can use at 100 millimeters to prevent zoom creep. Pretty straightforward. One other thing, however, that is worth noting in that this lens, you can focus down as close as 88 centimeters and get an extremely high magnification of 0.41 times magnification. As far as I know, that is class leading for a lens like this. And so that is obviously another strength that comes with it. So there are obviously some things that are missing here and uh, there doesn't seem to be room in the design for something like a tripod collar, but it's light enough probably not going to need it. Um, but, you know, what is here is while it's, you know, Canon's consumer grade of design, it feels, you know, nicely made and I like the finish on it and it worked just fine out in the field. 
Now this lens does have uh, Canon's IS system, so image stabilizer, and as noted, you don't have different modes to access on it, and so it's just one size fits all. At the same time, however, it's actually rated one half stop faster than what the L-series lens uh, is, so 5.5 stops uh, versus five stops, and if you have a body with in-body image stabilization, Canon says you can get up to six stops. I found that that's true, though not with any kind of consistency. So for example, I got this shot um, just on my mantle, at one sixth of a second, that equals out to six stops of stabilization. But it was one, the only one of seven where I considered it even sufficiently stabilized. And what I found is that there are some shots, you know, for example, I was able to get this shot of, I wanted this little bit of running water in the spring melt. I wanted to be able to, you know, drag the shutter just a little bit to get a sense of that moving water. And so I handheld a pretty low shutter speed. I was able to do that. At the same time, however, I went out on my hikes and I was shocked at shots at say at like 100 of a second where it wasn't well stabilized. And so the stabilizer seems to work well at times, but not always consistently well in a way that I'm uh, accustomed to. And so uh, some, you know, some pros and cons there. Now, what is a serious pro is the fact that it has a nano USM focus motor. Now, while this only has one focus motor, I find that because of the smaller elements in the design, it really has just as much focus speed as what the L-series lens was. Um, and I actually felt that I could go from a minimum focus to infinity. I could rack that focus more quickly here than what I felt like I could do with the L-series lens. And again, it's because of those smaller and lighter elements. The upside of this, though, is that I found autofocus to be very responsive, very quiet, very smooth in operation. And while I wasn't really in a great situation at this time of year, the problem is, is that there's still ice near the shoreline and birds tend to be out near the open water, but it's not safe to go out on the ice. So byproduct is it's hard to get close to birds at this point. But what I did find is that I felt like I could, could track action, uh, you know, fairly good. And I feel like this uh, autofocus system is going to be perfectly sufficient. What I did find is that I had no problem with you know, birds, be they in my backyard or animals, and picking up the eye very quickly and tracking appropriately and getting well uh, focused shots, whether it's of my cats or of turkeys that happen to be in the backyard. This chipmunk, I got good results in each one of these situations. So autofocus gets very high marks for me. So let's talk about image quality. We're gonna take a little bit of a deep dive into the image quality performance. There's some good, there's some bad. Let's check it out and see what you get in this inexpensive lens. So taking a look at vignette and distortion, we can see that neither is very extreme at 100 millimeters. You have a mild amount of a pincushion distortion, you can see here, and a little bit of vignette. Now your standard correction profile is going to take care of all of that. However, if you manually correct, as I have here, so we can see how much is there, there's a minus seven that was required to correct the distortion and a very mild amount of vignette with a plus 32. And I slid that midpoint over to give us a nice linear correction. 400 millimeters, again, we can continue to see a little bit of pincushion distortion, a little bit less here, and maybe a little bit more of the vignette. I corrected with a minus five on the distortion and a plus 46 on the vignette. So while it is a little bit more on the vignette, it's still a nice and mild, and for an RF lens, it's actually quite low. Now, I didn't see any kind of huge issue with uh, aberrations in the typical fringing kind of way. So here along the edge of this frame, we're looking for lateral chromatic aberrations that tend to show up along the edges of the frame as uh, both the green and purple uh, fringing on either side of these kind of high transition thing areas, but we just don't see it, so no problem there. And while we're not going to see any kind of strong fringing here in the out of focus area, what I did see uh, quite often, as you can see right here, is just a little bit of blooming around some of these transition areas where it's more like spherical aberrations that are uh, keeping you from having really great contrast. Here's another case in point here. And so you can see it really doesn't go quite to the extreme of actual fringing, but neither is it a kind of pure transition line. You can just see that texture kind of blooming along the edge of that. Even if you look at the chain here, again, it's not quite to the level of aberrations, but definitely not, you know, that really high degree of contrast. So basically just um, a little bit of reduced contrast that, that do point to aberrations, but not so much in the form of fringing. Fringing is fairly well controlled. 
So here's a look at the test chart, and this is at 100 millimeters, f5.6 is our maximum aperture here. And so as you can see, looking at things globally, it looks okay. Zooming into the center, we have fairly good resolution and contrast here, looking pretty good. If we move off center uh, towards the mid frame, we see that that starts to drop though, particularly when it comes to contrast, where we're just not getting quite the high detail. And if we move down here towards the corner, we can just see that those textures look are starting to look kind of muddy and blurred, not really able to distinguish. So, I mean, in this case, our 50 or excuse me, 45 megapixels of resolution may be a little bit higher than what this lens is capable of. Stopping down a full stop to f8 gives us some improvement in the center of the frame in terms of that contrast and resolution. A much more obvious improvement here in the mid frame to where things are moving into what I call good territory. Down on the bottom, however, we still don't really sharpen up all that much. If we move on up to f11, we can see that there is continuing to be some improvement here in the, in the edge of the frame, though it never reaches what I would call excellent levels. Now, just for a little bit of maybe unwanted perspective, but again, F11, which is where we got our best results across the frame compared to wide open F4.5 on the RF 100 to 500, we can see in the middle of the frame that, I mean, obviously our resolution and contrast is a little bit better on the RF lens wide open or the, uh, the L lens, I should say 100 to 500. In the mid frame though, that you know, the gap grows to where it's much more obviously sharp, wide open than what the 100 to 400 is at F11. And down here in the corner, it's just not even a competition. I mean, at its best, this lens really doesn't scratch the surface of what the L series lens is capable of doing off in the corner of the frame. This is pretty obviously a case of the old saying, you get what you pay for. Now our minimum aperture is a variable aperture um, and that at 100 millimeters it's f32 and then at 400 millimeters it'll be, it'll be as small as f45. I would avoid anything past f16 because of the simple rule of diffraction. You get that aperture that small and you know light starts to get bent and confused. It ends up robbing uh, contrast as you can see here that we're much sharper at f5.6 than we are at f32. And so I would use f16 as a practical limit. Now the next mark position on the zoom range is 135 millimeters and already max our maximum aperture has dropped to f6.3. So we've already lost some light even by 135 millimeters. Pretty much the same performance as what we saw earlier in that the center looks pretty good. Uh, moving off to the mid frame, you definitely see some drop off in terms of you know, contrast and resolution and then corner performance being, you know, okay, but fairly weak, particularly when it comes to contrast. Now by 200 millimeters, our maximum aperture is F7.1. So we're continuing to close down. I would actually recommend cl closing down further to F8 and you'll see why. You can see that only while, while it's only one third of a stop in terms of light gathering, you just improve your contrast so much by stopping the lens down that bit to F8. It's just really obviously better at F8 than it is at F7.1. All across the frame, you can see even in this area where it's weakest, it is better still down here at F8 relative to uh, F7.1. Though, as before, the corners never really get as sharp as what we saw from the L series lens under any circumstance. Here's a real world shot at right under 200 millimeters and F8. And you can see out in the real world, just for a little bit of perspective, this shot actually looks quite good and across the middle of the frame here. I mean, you can tell that you've lost a little bit of Christmas towards the edge, but I think it all looks acceptably sharp here. And really there's quite a lot of detail across this frame, uh, all things considered. And so, you know, that's an image where I think that the lens, you know, has really handled this, the uh, situation fairly well, which goes to show that the lens like this, one of its, maybe not the first purpose you'd think of it, of uh, is as a landscape lens, but uh, it can, because it's so lightweight and portable, it could be a very effective landscape lens when you're looking at bigger scenes. Now by 300 millimeters, we've reached our maximum aperture of F8, which is where we'll remain throughout. 300 millimeters, you know, again, looks fairly good in the center of the frame, not perfectly pin sharp, but, you know, an improved a little bit by F11, uh, a more obvious improvement in the mid frame where contrast is obviously better at F11, though our F8 performance doesn't look too bad here in the mid frame. Down into the edge, you know, it's 
okay at f8 a little bit better at f11 where you can just see more detail is there and you can see that contrast has improved somewhat Moving on to 400 millimeters, and you can see that again, mid-frame performance just slightly lower than what we saw at 300 millimeters. And again, you can see that if you stop down to F11, you're getting a little bit more contrast there. I do think that our um, mid-frame performance is a little bit weaker. It stops down, uh, you know, and improves a little bit in terms of contrast there. And down into the corners, corners remain, you know, fairly weak here and uh, improved a little bit at F11. Jumping back to the L series lens here for a moment, comparing exact same settings, a few things are going to stand out. I mean, first of all, obviously the L series lens gives you better contrast and detail. We've already seen that. One thing I'll also point out, however, is it is delivering a brighter performance at equal settings. And so that tells me that this lens is maybe even darker still at f8 than what we might hope for because it's definitely looking better and more detailed and brighter um, at the same settings on the L series lens and down into the corners I mean it's just no competition in the corners the uh, L series is really kind of a night and day improvement there now that's not to say you can't get good results at um, f8 400 millimeters with this lens um, we can see here and once the texture pops in that um, you know we've really got quite good detail in this frame to where the subject area is nice and crisp and if we pan over here you can see there is a lot of uh, detail and you know real world contrast here looks fairly good and frankly I mean it's looking fairly good right off towards the edge of the frame here not a bad result there at all Likewise, here up close, again, 400 millimeters and F8, we can see on Ferrari's face that we've got, you know, quite good detail. And, you know, there's a lot of very fine hairs that are able to be delineated here on the 45 megapixels of the R5 sensor. And so really quite a good result there as well. So as noted, the uh, RF 100-400 has a very nice maximum magnification of 0.41 times at 88 centimeters. And that gives you obviously a, a very high degree of magnification. And detail up close is, you know, fairly good, all things considered. That had some nice real world applications allowing me to get really close to you know objects like this and obviously really uh, defocus a background and, and that'll kind of gives us a transition into talking about the bokeh because a lens like this and here's another shot where i needed a, a shot for a, a thumbnail of my review long-term review of my 35 millimeter f 1.4 g master lens and you can see again at 400 millimeters and f8 that it's just crushed out the background and so everything is nice and smooth that's kind of best case scenario for this lens uh, here's another you know in a similar situation where I'm able to isolate a subject and as we can see if we pop in on the subject we've got nice detail right under 300 millimeters for this shot but you can see looking towards the background that it's really nicely blurred out now in this shot, the background isn't quite as far away. And so once again, we're really nice and close and the black background is nicely blurred. This is a fallen log with, you know, various things growing on it. So you can see here that, you know, in a little bit higher contrast scene, some of the contrast hasn't held up quite as well and the defocused area is slightly more busy because it's not as out of focus you can see in this shot though where the ratio is not quite so favorable detail is okay here on this but you can see that our background is looking much more busy here and it doesn't handle situations as well when you're not quite as close to your subject and this shot is another I was shooting some wild turkeys in my backyard ugly beast but let's move away from the ugly beast and look at this background which really to me is uh, it's has that what you would call nervous quality and you can just see that it's not rendered in a way like a high-end lens would now, obviously it isn't a high-end lens but there are areas where the you know the more budget uh, design shows up and that's in these ratios where your distance to subject to the background isn't as favorable all in all, it's a okay performance and, uh, you know, it's, it's really good enough to get the job done, but neither is it exceptional in any way, really. So as I noted in that sec segment, you get what you pay for. And in this case, while I think this image quality is sufficiently good, and particularly if you're shooting with the lower resolution bodies, you'll probably be even happier with it. But it's certainly not at the L series lens in terms of performance. Of course, that lens, as noted at the beginning, is somewhere near four and a half times as expensive. So you really shouldn't expect this lens to hang with that lens. And it doesn't. But at the same time, I think for many people, its image quality is going to be good enough to get you shots that you're going 
going to be happy with. And at the end of the day, I think that that's going to be what matters for a lot of people. The L-Series lens is simply out of the grasp for many photographers, while this lens is not going to be. So I think that that makes it a great value and intriguing proposition for many photographers in the here and now. The only uh, fly in the ointment that I see for the future is that I know from past experience that both Sigma and Tamron have made 100 to 400 millimeter lenses that have fewer compromises than this lens does. So should they ever get around to making RF versions versions of those lenses, this lens is probably going to have some serious competition at that point. But right now, it doesn't. And so if you're looking for an inexpensive telephoto zoom lens, the RF 100 to 400 millimeter f5.6 to f8 IS USM is a very good option. I'm Dustin Abbott, and if you'll look in the description down below, you can find linkage to my full text review, also to an image gallery. You can see more photos there. There are buying links down below if you'd like to purchase one for yourself. Linkage there to follow myself or Craig on social media or to check out our new channel, Let the Light In TV. You can get channel merchandise, become a patron, and of course, if you haven't already, uh, please click that subscribe button right here on YouTube. Be sure to ring that bell so you get notification when new content drops. Thanks for watching. Have a great day and let the light in.